Welcome back to The Shivering Mouse. I'm so excited to see you here today. And today we're going to continue our journey through the Chronicles of Narnia. Today we're starting Prince Caspian, which is the next book in the series. And it's a bit more of a familiar one. It's been made into movies a little more than um, most of the others. The, obviously the most common one being The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But Prince Caspian is probably one of the next most adapted ones, so it'll probably be a lot more familiar to you than The Magician's Nephew or The Horse and His Boy, but I think those two books give you a lot more context. Caspian takes place um, about a year after the events of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe in English time, and it kind of continues the journey of our four main characters, Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy. And so it's nice to see kind of what their further adventures in Narnia would be. So this is more of a true sequel to The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe than The Horse and His Boy is, because that's just kind of one of the adventures that takes place during the reign of the Pevensies, whereas this is afterwards. So it's pretty interesting, and it gives you more, um, kind of more information on what it would be like to be someone who had lived two lifetimes in two different worlds and how it changes how they view not only their own world but how they view Narnia now that they're a year older and now that they've been kind of immersed back into their own culture for a little bit. So without further ado, C.S. Lewis's Prince Caspian, Chapter 1, The Island. Once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy, and it has been told in another book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe how they had a remarkable adventure. They had opened the door to a magic wardrobe and found themselves in quite a different world from ours, and that different world sorry, and in that different world they became kings and queens in a country called Narnia. While they were in Narnia they seemed to reign for years and years, but when they came back, though the door when they came back through the door and found themselves in England again, it all seemed to have taken no time at all. At any rate, no one noticed that they had ever been away, and they never told anyone except for one very wise grown-up. That had all happened a year ago, and now all four of them were sitting on a seat in a railway station with trunks and play boxes piled up around them. They were, in fact, on their way back to school. They had traveled together as far as this station, which was a junction, and here, in a few minutes, one train would arrive to take the girls away to one school, and about a half an hour later, another train would arrive and take the boys off to go to another school. The first part of the journey, when they were all together, always seemed to be like part of the holidays, but now that they would be saying goodbye and going in different ways so soon, everyone felt that the holidays were really over and that their term-time feeling was beginning again, and they were all rather gloomy, and no one could think of anything to say. Lucy was going to boarding school for the first time. It was an empty, sleepy country station, and there was hardly anyone on the platform except for themselves. Suddenly, Lucy gave a sharp little cry, like someone who has been stung by a wasp. "'What's up, Lou?' said Edmund, and then suddenly he broke off and made a noise like, "'Ow!' "'What on earth?' began Peter, but then he too suddenly changed what he had been going to say, and instead he said, "'Susan, let go! What are you doing? Where are you dragging me to?' "'I'm not touching you,' said Susan. "'Someone is pulling me. Oh, oh, stop it!' Everyone noticed that all of the others' faces had gone very white. "'I felt just the same,' said Edmund, in a breathless voice, "'as if I were being dragged along, a most frightful pulling. "'Ugh! It's beginning again!' "'Me too,' said Lucy. "'Oh, I can't bear it!' "'Look sharp,' shouted Edmund. "'All catch hands and keep together. This is magic. I can tell by the feeling.' "'Yes,' said Susan. "'Hold hands. Oh, I do wish it would stop. Oh!' The next moment, the luggage, the seat, the platform, and the station had all completely vanished. The four children, holding hands and panting, found themselves standing in a woody place, such a woody place, that branches were sticking into them here and there, and there was hardly room to move. They all rubbed their eyes and took a deep breath. "'Oh, Peter!' exclaimed Lucy. "'Do you think we could have possibly got back to Narnia?' "'It might be anywhere,' said Peter. "'I can't see a yard in all these trees. "'Let's try to get into the open, if there is any open.' "'With some difficulty, and with some stings from nettles and pricks from thorns, "'they struggled out of the thicket. "'Then they had another surprise. "'Everything became much brighter, and after a few steps "'they found themselves at the edge of the wood, "'looking down on a sandy beach. "'A few yards away, a very calm sea was falling on the land "'with such tiny ripples that it made hardly any sound. There was no land in sight, no clouds in the sky. The sun was right about where it ought to be at about ten o'clock in the morning, and the sea was a dazzling blue. They stood sniffing in the sea smell. 
by Jove, said Peter, this is good enough. Five minutes later, everyone was barefoot and waded in the cool, clear water. This is better than being in a stuffy train on the way back to Latin and French and algebra, said Edmund. And then, for quite a long time, there was no more talking, only splashing and looking for shrimps and crabs. All the same, said Susan presently, I suppose we'll have to make some plans. We shall want something to eat before too long. We've got those sandwiches Mother gave us for the journey, said Edmund, or at least I've got mine. Not me, said Lucy. Mine were in my little bag. So were mine, said Susan. Mine were in my coat pocket. Mine are in my coat pocket there on the beach, said Peter, and that'll be two lunches among four. This isn't going to be much fun. At present, said Lucy, I want something to drink more than something to eat. Everyone else now felt thirsty, as one usually does when wading in salt water under the hot sun. It's like being shipwrecked, remarked Edmund. In, school, in books, they always talk about finding springs of clear, fresh water on the island. We'd better go look for them. Does that mean we have to go back into all that thick wood, said Susan? Not a bit of it, said Peter. If there are streams, they're bound to come down to the sea, and if we walk along the beach, we're bound to come to them. They all now waded back and went first across the smooth, wet sand, and then up to the dry, crumbly sand that sticks to one's toes, and began putting on their shoes and socks. Edmund and Lucy wanted to leave them behind and do their exploring with bare feet, but Susan said that this would be a mad thing to do. We might never find them again, she pointed out, and we shall want them if we're still here when night comes and it begins to be cold. When they were dressed again, they went out along the shore with the sea to their left hand and the wood on their right. Except for an occasional seagull, it was a very quiet place. The wood was so thick and tangled that they could hardly see into it at all, and nothing moved, not a bird not even an insect. Shells and seaweed and anemones or tiny crabs and rock pools are all very well, but you soon get tired of them if you're thirsty. The children's feet, after all the change from the cool water, felt hot and heavy. Susan and Lucy had raincoats to carry. Edmund had put his coat down at the station seat just before the magic overtook them, and he and Peter took in turns carrying Peter's greatcoat. Presently, the shore began to curve around to the right. About a quarter of an hour later, after they crossed the rocky ridge, which ran out into a point, it made a very sharp turn. Their backs were now to the part of the sea that they had met when they first came out of the wood. Now, looking ahead, they could see the water on another shore, thickly wooded, just like the one they were exploring. "'I wonder, is that an island, or do we join it presently?' said Lucy. "'Don't know,' said Peter, and they all plodded on in silence." The shore they were walking on drew nearer and nearer to, towards the opposite shore as they came around the promontory. The children expected to find a place where the two joined, but in this way they were disappointed. They came to some rocks which they had to climb from the top so that they could see far ahead, and, oh, bother, said Edmund, it's no good. We shan't be able to get to those other woods at all. We are on an island. It was true. At this point, the channel between them and the opposite coast was only about thirty or forty yards wide, but they could now see that this was the narrowest place. After that, their own coast bent around to the right again, and they could see the open sea between it and the mainland. It was obvious that they had already come much more than halfway around the island. "'Look,' said Lucy suddenly, "'what's that?' She was pointing to a long, silvery, snake-like thing that lay across the beach. "'A stream! A stream!' shouted the others, and, as tired as they were, they lost no time in clattering down the rocks and racing to the fresh water. They knew that the stream would be better to drink farther up away from the beach, so they went at once to the spot where it came from the wood. The trees were thick as ever, but the stream made itself a deep course through the high, mossy banks, so that by stooping you could follow it up a sort of tunnel of leaves.' They dropped on their knees by the first by the first brown dimply pool and drank and drank and dipped their faces into the water and then dipped their arms up to the elbow. Now, said Edmund, what about those sandwiches? Oh, hadn't we better save them, said Susan. We may need them far worse later on. I do wish, said Lucy, now that we're not thirsty, we could go on feeling as not hungry as we did when we were thirsty. But what about those sandwiches, repeated Edmund. "'There's no sense in saving them. They'll go bad. "'You've got to remember that it's a good deal hotter here than it was in England, "'and we've been carrying them about in our pockets for hours. 
So they got out the two packets and divided them into four portions, and nobody had quite enough, but it was a great deal better than having nothing. Then they talked about their plans for the next meal. Lucy wanted to go back to the sea to catch shrimps until someone pointed out that they didn't have any nets. Edmund said that they must gather gull's eggs from the rocks, but when they came to think of it, they couldn't remember having seen any gull's eggs, and it wouldn't be able to cook them anyway if they found any. Peter thought to himself that unless they had a some stroke of good luck, they would soon be glad to have the eggs raw, but he didn't see any point in saying this out loud. Susan said it was a pity that they hadn't saved the sandwiches longer, and one or two tempers nearly got lost along the way at this point. Finally, Edmund said, Look here, there's only one thing to be done. We must explore the woods. Hermits and knights errant and people like that always manage to live somehow if they're in the forest. They find roots and berries and things. What sorts of roots? said Susan. I always thought that meant roots of trees, said Lucy. Come on, said Peter. Ed is right, and we must try to do something. It'll be better than going out into the glare of the sun again. So they all got up and began to follow the stream. It was very hard work. They had to stoop under branches and climb over branches, and they blundered through great masses of stuff like rhododendrons and tore their clothes and got their feet wet in the stream, and still there was no noise at all except the noise of the stream and the noises they were making themselves. They were beginning to get very tired of it when they noticed a delicious smell and then a flash of bright color high above them at the top of a right tree at the top of the right bank. I say, exclaimed Lucy, I do believe that's an apple tree. It was. They panted up the steep bank and forced their way through some brambles and found themselves standing around an old tree that was heavy with large yellowish golden apples as firm and as juicy as you could wish to see. And this is not the only tree, said Edmund, with his mouth full of apple. Look there, and there. Why, there are dozens of them, said Susan, throwing away the core of her first apple and picking her second. This must have been an orchard, long, long ago, before the place went wild and the wood grew up. Then this was once an inhabited island, said Peter. And what's that, said Lucy, pointing ahead. By Jove, it's a wall, said Peter, an old stone wall. Pressing their way between the laden branches, they reached the wall. It was very old and broken down in places, with moss and wallflowers growing on it, but it was higher than all of the tallest trees, and when they came cl quite close to it, they found a great arch, which must have been quite the gate, but was now almost filled with the largest of all the apple trees. They had to break some of the branches to get past, but when they had done that, they blinked in surprise, because the daylight suddenly became much brighter. They found themselves in a wide open place with walls all around it. In here there were no trees, only level grass and daisies and ivy and gray walls. It was a bright, secret, quiet place, and rather sad, and all four stepped into the middle of it, glad to be able to straighten their backs and limbs and move freely. The next chapter is The Ancient Treasure House, and it's one of my favorite chapters in the whole series of the Chronicles of Narnia, and I hope that you'll enjoy it as much as I do. I'll see you next week. Thank you for tuning in.